Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Um, do I have to turn this up? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, uh, I'm um, uh, going to talk about Charles Dickens, which is pretty cheeky of me, considering Claire Tomlin's in the room here. Um, but, uh, um, in fact, um, I'm not going to talk about Charles Dickens. I'm going to talk about me and Charles Dickens. Uh, as it happens, whenever I do talk about Charles Dickens, I try to find out, because he was so peripatetic, he was all over the place, all over the country and uh, all over America too, uh, if he's been somewhere in the, uh, the area in which I'm talking. And uh, so I, I Google him, and I, I Googled um, uh, Charles Dickens, Notting Hill Gate, and um, the answer was Simon Callow. So um, <laughs> I, here I am, Charles Dickens' representative on Earth this evening. But um, I, I, could I just tell you, uh, the, the very, my first, very first glimpse of Shakespeare was, in fact, in a dramatized form. It was A Christmas Carol. I was uh, five years old. Uh, it was uh, to theater in the round in Croydon, long since de demolished, and it scared the hell out of me, which was exactly what it should do. And I think it might have frightened me off Dickens for some years. Um, time passed. Uh, when I was 13, I got chicken pox, which as everybody who's had it is a vile medieval horror of an ailment to have. Um, you want to scratch yourself all the time and then it makes it 10 times worse and so on. And my wonderful grandmother um, uh, had an answer to this. She pressed a copy of the Pickwick Papers into my hands. And from that second on, I never scratched again. So I was grateful to Charles Dickens. Uh, I watched, as we all did probably, those um, uh, uh, adaptations of Dickens on the television, uh, children's adaptations, half-hour episodes, fantastic wonderfully acted, inspired, and inspiring. Uh, and then, in the fullness of time, I went to drama school. And when I left drama school, I got a job in repertory theater in Lincoln. And one of the very first plays that I got to do was A Christmas Carol, again. And um, uh, we adapted it ourselves, more or less. We uh, improvised it. And uh, I think it was really quite a, a, a good show, uh, one way or another. Um, but it was not without its hazards. Uh, because, of course, in A Christmas Carol, inevitably, there's a lot of snow. And in the Theatre Royal in Lincoln, an impoverished repertory, uh, uh, we couldn't afford any of that fancy snow. What happened was that the stage management got hold of polystyrene cups and uh, 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 scrunched them up, uh, and then they were uh, uh, let down onto the stage from a sort of sack up in the wings. Um, and as uh, uh, inevitably also in A Christmas Carol, uh, one frequently had to come on stage and sing Christmas carols, uh, as we opened our hearts and our vocal cords, uh, they normally got coated immediately with um, uh, polystyrene, uh, which is a very difficult thing to dislodge, I may tell you. And so the infants of Lincoln may have been somewhat baffled that every so often the nice young Victorian ladies and gentlemen on stage in front would rush into the wings and go... Bleh! just really the only way to dislodge it. Um, there were other hazards too. There was the occasion when I was playing, um, uh, I should tell you, um, amongst other parts, I was playing Bob Cratchit and uh, Mr. Fezziwig. And the highlight of the evening for me uh, uh, as Mr. Fezziwig, but really the highlight of the evening was the ball that Mr. Fezziwig throws. And uh, uh, it was led by me doing vigorous dances, uh, uh, um, the dashing white sergeants and cotillions and things like that. And um, uh, on one occasion, though, one afternoon, um, Mrs. Fezziwig and I uh, uh, dashingly white sergeanted around the stage and uh, suddenly fell through it. <laughs> because the overtaxed stage management had uh, neglected to lock up the trap door out of which presently uh, Scrooge's tomb would emerge. And so we just fell 18 foot down uh, uh, onto the very, very uh, bottom of the, uh, uh, the foundations of the theater. And uh, once we'd ascertained that we were in fact alive, um, <clears throat> which was not certain, uh, we looked up and saw 12 anxious little faces peering into the pit and uh, uh, trying to indicate to the stage management to bring in the curtain and such like, but, but nobody knew what to do. Everybody was paralyzed and so, um, I found that there was a, a, a useful stepladder at the side of the stage, so I climbed up out of it, uh, 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 and then the children were in for another surprise because um, where Mr. Fezziwig had fallen down the uh, hole, 
Uh, and in fact, one of the um, uh, actors rather brilliantly had improvised the immortal line, so, Mr. Fezziwig, down in the wine cellar again, are we? <laughs> uh, the person that emerged from the cellar was, in fact, Bob Cratchit, because the only thing that distinguished me from Mr. Fezziwig was my wig and my spectacles, and both of those had disappeared from me. <laughs> And so uh, we, 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 we resumed our dashing white sergeant and uh, fell into the wings in a state of exhaustion, absolute hysterical exhaustion. Um, uh, um, but that wasn't the worst of it. Uh, the worst of it really was um, a little later, um, we'd, um, it was a bit terrible winter, that winter. It was the winter of 1973. It was, as some of you will remember, uh, the three-day week. It was the, the heights or the depths of Edward Heath's government. Uh, the fairy lights that had been strung up down Lincoln High Street had never been switched on. There was great glumness and there was great coldness everywhere. It was very hard to get warm. Uh, and so the actors got ill one after another. And one day I came in to do my first uh, uh, performance at 10 o'clock in the morning to get made up. And the director said to me, Simon, you're going to have to go on as Scrooge. And I said, but... Uh, I, 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 I don't know Scrooge's lines. I, I don't know my own lines. I don't see how that's going to happen. And she turned magnificently to the 750 children uh, queuing up and said, are you going to disappoint these children? And I said, yes, absolutely, without a moment's hesitation. And the theater being the kind of place it is, five minutes later, I was being put into the costume of Scrooge. And I said, as I numbly got into the, the togs, uh, I said, uh, um, but uh, I, I don't really know where to go or what to do. And she said, never mind, I'm coming on with you. <laughs> I said, as what? <laughs> and she said, an angel. <laughs> and so five minutes later, on she came. She'd found a wand from somewhere. Angels, fairies, they were all the same to her. Um, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, th that was all extraordinary enough, and I, I kind of said th stuff. She would bark instructions at me. She'd say, uh, 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 move forward, there's the light, go for that, go for the light, go for the light. And, and you're sad now, and things like that. <laughs> uh, um, so I, I, I struggled as best I could, and I sort of was getting through it all right. Um, but then came uh, the scenes in which Scrooge acts with Bob Cratchit. <laughs> and... What had happened here was that um, one of the actresses had her boyfriend staying with her, and this young man had come to the theater in order to say goodbye to her, and he'd been seized by the stage management and thrown into the costume of Bob Cratchit. And somehow we played a scene that neither of us knew or had the slightest idea about. Uh, and uh, um, the extraordinary thing is nobody noticed anything at all strange. And I lost uh, pretty well a stone in weight uh, during that performance. But uh, so I then uh, uh, progressed in my career and I came eventually to play uh, Mr. Micawber uh, on one of those, the very last of those children's Dickens adaptations before they got sort of serious and artistic, but were just telling the story. And uh, it was very uh, enjoyable indeed. But I still don't really know how it is that not many years later I was invited by the BBC to uh, reconstruct Charles Dickens's public readings. And it's kind of rather shaming that although a, 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 a Pickwick Papers had really turned me into a Dickens addict, and I'd read my way through pretty well all of the books, uh, slowly, bit by bit, over the years, um, I, I didn't know that Dickens had done public readings. And much less did I know that when he did these readings, he was absolutely brilliant as an actor, that he was an extraordinary performer, that he was, in fact, one of the greatest performers of the mid-Victorian theatre, and that his concerts, his, his, his uh, uh, readings were like rock concerts, that they were absolutely sold out, that people fought literally for tickets, that uh, uh, there was a huge black market in them, and that wherever he went, uh, people uh, 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 not only attended uh, um, for the pleasure of the performance itself, which was considerable, but because in some kind of way, Dickens 
had been speaking for them when he wrote. Um, these, these events were uh, uh, unparalleled. I can't think of any possible comparison. Is that five, five minutes more I have? Okay, fine. Uh, um, uh, 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 to, in, in, I can't think of any other writer in the history of literature, except perhaps Homer, who actually uh, performed his own work in that kind of circumstance. It was a great civic event when Dickens came to the town. And uh, um, so um, I, that started me, really, on the whole course of becoming fascinated by the man. And there's a, there's a vast amount written about Dickens, and continues to be written about Dickens, and the astonishing thing is that people still discover extraordinary new riches in Dickens. And uh, um, uh, I, I, uh, I, I've had, I read all those kind of books, and I, I put everything I, I, I understood from the books into the performances on the television, and they were very successful. And one of the most interesting things about these things was that I did the repertory that Dickens did. And Dickens did quite a wide range of adaptations from his own books, but some of the most successful things that he did were pieces that he'd written as a kind of one-off contribution, short stories, to one of his magazines, to All the Year Round or Household Words, uh, of which he was the editor. And he would often write a story kicking off uh, a sequence of uh, sequels which were written by other writers, by Mrs. Gaskell or by Wilkie Collins or, or, or such like uh, friends of Dickens. And uh, um, uh, uh, I performed one of them, which uh, is, is called uh, uh, Dr. Marigold, uh, and which um, I had been uh, advised very strongly not to do by the man who was the world's greatest authority on Charles Dickens's public readings, a great uh, uh, teacher and writer called Philip Collins. And uh, Phil had said to me, I've done him, Simon, I've done it, and it doesn't work, all right? So I said, well, you know, I'm sorry, Phil, but I just have this feeling that it might kind of work. And we did a performance in the Ambassador's Theatre with an audience dressed in Victorian costumes. And as I did the, uh, the, the, the piece, um, the uh, uh, um, uh, cameras were trained on the audience as well. And it's deeply satisfying to me to say that uh, we managed to get real tears out of that audience. And that these pieces of Dickens, when they're performed, prove to be as great as anything in his literature, because he was a great performance artist. And I came to a conclusion, uh, uh, which I have then subsequently wrote about, uh, about Dickens is the writer as actor. And uh, it's, uh, you always are aware of Dickens in his own writing. You never lose the man. You never forget yourself in the characters. He is always present. And so over the last few years, I've, I've as it were, been becoming Dickens. And uh, it's an extraordinary sensation. I can tell you, <laughs> exhausting is what it is, because he was a man whose energy was simply boundless, whose uh, interest, whose curiosity, whose craving to communicate is the very thing that I think we feel when we read Dickens. The man has a need to connect with his audience, which is exactly what we as actors experience all the time. Um, generally, we're given more than 15 minutes to do it in. Um, I think uh, I've probably uh, come to the end of my 15 minutes. I have two more minutes. How wonderful. <laughs> well, um, I, what, what, what more? I can tell you what... what how, how, <laughs> the, 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 the possibilities are absolutely limitless. Uh, uh, um, uh, it, it's very touching to me to think that uh, in the very uh, last year of his life, Dickens, who used to take... Uh, friends and, uh, and friends of friends round London, showing them the locations of where his characters had lived or, or, or where they died. Uh, um, uh, but uh, on one occasion, he took some friends round uh, um, the, the West End of London, and uh, he pointed at a theater, and he said, that's what I should have done with my life. I should have run a great theater. I should have written all the plays, told all the actors what to do. 
that is what my destiny really was and really should have been. And again, I cannot think of any novelist uh, who's had such an engagement. There have been many fine novelists who've written plays, like Somerset Maugham and so on, uh, uh, but I can't think of anyone who was so actively engaged in the theatre as a, as, as, a, as a profession, as an avocation, and as a therapy in an extraordinary kind of way. Dickens absolutely required the, the amount of love that Dickens required in his life was limitless and uh, all the better to come from an anonymous thing like an audience. And he provoked scenes of the most extraordinary rapture. When he first went to America, he got what was in effect, and that, that was when he was very young and had just written Nicholas Nickleby and Oliver Twist and the uh, Pickwick Papers, uh, he'd uh, uh, got a ticker tape reception in New York. And wherever he went for the rest of his life, uh, he was pursued by people, not to his great uh, gratification, because like many people who, who, who long to be loved by a lot of people, they don't actually like the experience of the hands-on contact of that love. Uh, they cut locks of his hair off, they tore pieces of his clothes off. Uh, um, and uh, now I really have spoken for 15 minutes, so I thank you very much. Thank you.